let's take a look at scientific management. Scientific management thoroughly studies and tests different work methods to identify the best, most efficient way to complete a job. Frederick Taylor is the father of scientific management. He began his career as a worker at the Midvale Steel Company. Taylor was promoted to pattern maker, supervisor, and then chief engineer. At Midvale, Taylor was deeply affected by his three-year struggle to get the men who worked for him to do what he called a fair day's work. Taylor, who had worked alongside the men as a co-worker before becoming their boss, said, We, who were the workmen of the shop, had the quantity output carefully agreed upon for everything that was turned out in the shop. We limited the output to about, I would think, one-third of what we could have very well have done. Taylor explained that as soon as he became the boss, the men who were working under me knew that I was unto the whole game of soldiering or deliberately restricting output. When Taylor told his workers, I have accepted a job under the management of this company and I am on the other side of the fence, I'm going to try to get a bigger output, the workers responded, we warn you Fred, if you try to bust any of these rates, a rate buster was someone who worked faster than the group, we will have you over the fence in six weeks. Over the next three years, Taylor tried everything he could think of to approve output. By doing the job himself, he showed workers that it was possible to produce more output. He hired new workers and trained them himself, hoping they would produce more. But a very heavy social pressure, as Taylor called it, from other workers kept them from doing so. Pushed by Taylor, the workers began breaking their machines so they couldn't produce. Taylor responded by firing them every time they broke a machine or for any violation of the rules, no matter how small, such as being late to work. Tensions became so severe that some of the workers even threatened to shoot Taylor. Looking back at the situation, Taylor reflected, it's a horrid life for any man to live. Not being able to look any workman in the face all day long without seeing hostility there and feeling that every man around him is a vital enemy. He said, I made up my mind to either get out of the business entirely and go into some other line of work, or to find some remedy for this unbearable condition. The remedy that Taylor eventually developed was scientific management. Taylor, who was once described scientific management as 75% science and 25% common sense, emphasized that the goal of scientific management was to use a systematic study to find the one best way for doing each task. To do that, managers had to follow four principles. The first principle was to develop a science for each element of work. Study it, analyze it, determine the one best way to do the work. For example, one of Taylor's controversial proposals at the time was to give rest breaks to factory workers doing physical labor. We take morning, lunch, and afternoon breaks for granted. But in Taylor's day, factory workers were expected to work without stopping. When Taylor said the breaks would increase worker productivity, no one believed him. Nonetheless, through systematic experiments, he showed that workers receiving frequent rest breaks were able to greatly increase their daily output. Second, managers had to scientifically select, train, teach, and develop workers to help them reach their full potential. Before Taylor, supervisors often hired on the basis of favoritism and nepotism. Who you knew was often more important than what you could do. By contrast, Taylor instructed supervisors to hire first-class workers on the basis of their aptitude to do the job well. In one of the first applications of this principle, physical reaction times were used to select bicycle ball bearing inspectors who had to be able to examine ball bearings as fast as they were produced on the production line. For similar reasons, Taylor also recommended that companies train and develop their workers, a rare practice at the time. The third principle instructed managers to cooperate with employees to ensure that scientific principles were actually implemented. Labor unrest was widespread at the time. The number of labor strikes against companies doubled between 1893 and 1904. As Taylor knew from personal experience, workers and management more often than not viewed each other as enemies. Taylor's advice ran contrary to common wisdom of the day. 
He said, the majority of these men believe that the fundamental interests of employees and employers are not necessarily antagonistic. Scientific management, on the contrary, has, for its very foundation, the firm conviction that the true interests of the two are one and the same, that prosperity for the employer cannot exist through a long term of years unless it's accompanied by prosperity for employees and vice versa. The fourth principle of scientific management was to divide the work and responsibility equally between management and workers. Prior to Taylor, workers alone were held responsible for productivity and performance. But, said Taylor, almost every act of the workman should be preceded by one or more preparatory acts of the management, which enable him to do his work better and quicker than he otherwise could. Above all, Taylor believed these principles could be used to determine a fair day's work, that is, what an average worker could produce at a reasonable pace day in and day out. After that was determined, it was management's responsibility to pay workers fairly for a fair day's work. In essence, Taylor was trying to align management and employees so that there was good for employees and there was good for management.